In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you a plenary lecture that I have given at the International eWorkshop on Machine Learning Applications in Drug Discovery, Basic to Advanced from 17 to 31st of May 2021, which was organized by the Department of Biotechnology at Vignan University. And so my plenary lecture was on May 17, and the practical tutorial workshop is on May 18. And so in the plenary lecture, I talked about how I develop bioinformatics tools. And in the practical tutorial workshop, I talk about how you could develop your own bioinformatics tool using Python. And so the bioinformatics tool will be developed using the Streamlit library and also Scikit-learn and also Pandas, which will essentially take in Smiles notation of a molecule of your interest. And then Scikit-learn will be used to make a prediction. And we also will be needing the Articit library, which will be used for molecular descriptor calculation. And then finally, the Streamlit library will be used to contain every of the components that I have mentioned into the form of a web application. And so this web application, you could then also deploy it to the internet. And so I'm going to provide you the timeline in the video description. And so you could feel free to hop on to different parts of the video. And so let's get started. Okay. So the, the presentation slide is provided at this link, bit.ly bit.ly slash data professor dash bioinfo dash talk. And so today we're going to talk about towards the development of bioinformatics tools. And so in this one hour lecture or talk, um, I'm going to talk about like the, the high level overview of what we're doing at our university in our research center. And then later tomorrow, we're going to have a practical session showing you how to develop a bioinformatic tool using the Python programming language. And so uh, it will be similar to what I normally do on my YouTube channel. So a little bit about myself. So I'm currently at the Center of Data Mining at the Faculty of Medical Technology over at Mahidon University. And Mahidon University is one of the uh, oldest universities in Thailand and has consistently been amongst the uh, top ranking university in the biomedical science. And as some of you may know, I also run the YouTube channel called The Data Professor, where I have uh, tutorials and also concept videos about data science and also occasionally about bioinformatics. So at the interface of applying data science to biological data. And I'm also part-time uh, blogger at a uh, platform called Medium. And I normally publish in the Taurus data science. And so the typical article that I publish is tutorials showing you how to analyze the data uh, using Python or R, and also how you could develop bioinformatic application as well. So I really like this quote that was published in the PLOS Biology Journal. And the title of the article is All Biology is Computational Biology. So some of you who are experimental biologists or those of you who are computational biologists, so fundamentally all of you could be considered to be computational biologists because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're generating data, right? You're performing experiments you're, you're testing different, essentially you're testing different parameters, right? In computer science, you have parameters that you set, right? In your machine learning al algorithms, you would set like how many number of learning rates or what is the momentum? What is the learning epoch that you wanna use? So similarly in biology, you also try out different buffer, different pH. So essentially you're tuning the parameter and then you're performing the experiment, right? And then you're collecting the data. And then the data that you're collected, you're using it to make analysis. And nowadays it's very difficult to only use statistical analysis approach. So there is an extension to using more and more machine learning algorithms in order to make sense of the data. And so the, the quote here says that, I will argue that computational thinking and computational methods are so central to the quest of understanding life 
that today all biology is computational biology. And so our quest for understanding about life has been an ongoing quest ever since the dawn of humankind. And so we seek out to understand the world around us, even in the expedition, right? We wanted to discover the different parts of the world. And yeah, and nowadays our quest is, is extending toward the galaxy. We wanna discover what other galaxy or what other planet there are, right? From expedition from NASA and Elon Musk, uh, SpaceX company. And in biology, essentially in the life science, what we are generating is we're generating exponential amounts of data. And so this data is called omics data. And they're essentially coming from, yeah, they're essentially coming from the genomics, proteomics, glycomics, lipidomic, metabolomic, and also interactomic. And so you're just essentially adding the term omic at the end. And so you're essentially collecting data on the genes, on the proteins, on the sugar, on the lipids, and also metabolite, the breakdown of small molecule, and also the interaction among the molecule. And so all of this information collectively is known as the omics data. And so I have summarized this in the form of an infographic. And so in bio, biology or biochemistry 101, you have probably learned about the four macromolecules of life, right? So think of back in the days when you were in high school. So in biochemistry course, you have learned that the four macromolecules of life included protein, lipids, nucleic acid, and nucleic acids, you have DNA and RNA. And so aside from that, to mediate a lot of the biological processes, we also need metabolites, right? And the important thing is how do the metabolite, how do the protein, nucleic acid, and lipids, how do they interact with one another? And so that is an essential area. And so collectively, oh, and also you also learn about the carbohydrates or the sugar, right? And then you know that as the glycomic. And so collectively, all of this are known as the omics data. And therefore you can see that biology is data intensive because there is a lot of data being generated and it is inevitable that you will have to use more sophisticated computational approaches in analyzing and handling the data. And so there is a paradigm shift, right? So before we would have this conception that we try to develop a drug and we hope that it will pretty much be like a silver bullet, that it will cure all of the disease. But then that's not the truth because in recent years, we discovered and via the advance of the precision medicine, we're able to understand that in order to specifically target a particular disease, we need to target a specific a particular protein. And as a result, we also know that drugs also have side effects. And the reason being is that the drug may not be specific toward a single target protein. And so, for example, if you develop a drug that you think will target protein A, but then in reality, it also has a off-target binding to protein B. And so the binding, off-target binding to protein B will also cause a side effect, okay? And in Thailand, there's a professor, uh, his name is Dr. Dr. Dryrak Pisitgun from Chulai University, he developed this sophisticated bioinformatics approach in combination with experimental uh, using neoantigen. And then he's able to develop this cancer immunotherapy. And so in his research group, he uses bioinformatics hand in hand with experimentation. And so you can see that omics data are rather large and they're complex and they're heterogeneous. And so there's this term called the curse of dimensionality in that data is often characterized by thousands or 10,000s of variables. And therefore it renders the statistical approach that are traditionally used for analysis to be irrelevant in the context that there needs to be a better way to handle all of these massive data. And as you might know, data could come in many form not only tabular data, but also image data, sound, video, real-time streaming data. And so what is bioinformatics? 
So you're probably going to find out more in a series of lectures and workshops throughout this two weeks event, international event. And so let me kick this off by telling you that bioinformatics is a field that applies statistics and information theory, as well as machine learning in order to make sense of biological data. So it helps you to understand the molecular basis of how disease occur. For example, how mutated genes work. And so as an example, let's say that you identify which gene is responsible for a disease. So that is your intention. You wanna see which gene is responsible for a particular disease. And so how can you do that? Well, one way would be to compare the gene frequency in a proteomic analysis, meaning that you're going to extract the protein that are expressed from two different populations. One population are those who have the disease and another population are those who don't have the disease. And then you're just simply comparing the frequency of the gene. And then from proteomic analysis, you can then see which genes are more prevalent in one group versus the other. And so this is only a simple example. And so you can see here that bioinformatics is lying at the interface of biology and computer science, particularly in that biology, we have a lot of data that are being generated. And then in the field of computer science, we're applying that to make sense of the data. And so you can see that this is a good symbiosis between biology and computational science. All right, so as I mentioned already that bioinformatics is an area where you could apply computers to make sense of big biological data, which helps you to understand the intricate complex biological mechanism that are governing many of the biological phenomenon. And so as you have seen in the prior infographic that the post-genomic era has brought about various, various omics as, such as the genome, proteome, metabolome, microbiome, metagenome, interactome. And I'm sure there are several other omics. And so here are some of the common tasks that you could encounter in bioinformatics. And so for those of you who are coming from the field of computational science, you could look for possible tasks that you could apply computational science or machine learning to. And for those of you who are coming from the field of biology, then these are the, some of the tasks that you might look into in utilizing computational tools in order to help you analyze, plan, design, and discover novel genes, novel molecules that might help you to understand the biological mechanism. And so a common task for a bioinformatic researcher or graduate student would be to search public databases, right? For example, GenBank, PopCam, uh, there are several others, uh, Mint database and Uniprot, right? So there's several databases for you to search pertinent information on the gene, on the protein, on small molecule, and also pathway, right? Like the Keg database. And then after searching for it, you want to compare, right? And so a comparison could be, for example, performing a simple sequence alignment in order to see the similarity and the difference between the genes, proteins, RNA, and all the, also the small molecule. And aside from that, you would also like to visualize the structure if it is available, right, from the X-ray crystal structure. And also you could retrieve that from more databases, right, like the protein data bank. And aside from that, what if there's no available experimental structure? You could use computational approach to make prediction on the protein structure or the molecular structure of the entity of your interest. And aside from that, you could apply machine learning, deep learning in order to build predictive models that will be able to make prediction and help you to understand the contribution of the various feature on the data. And then integrate and curate. So this is pretty much in machine learning terms or the field of data science is data curation. And so a lot of people might find this process in data science a bit tedious, right? Because data cleaning and data curation will take up about 80% of your time, right? In order to make a high quality data, you will have to remove or handle missing data 
and also you try to clean the data or subset the data to be relevant for your particular analysis. And so I have made an infographic summarizing the aforementioned explanation into this one page infographic. And so it is search, compare, model, and also integrate. Okay. And so there's two, two terminologies, computational biology and bioinformatics that might, that some might wonder what's the difference between the two. So here's my interpretation of this. So in my own understanding and interpretation, computational biology focuses more on the utilization of computational tools in order to understand biology. Whereas in bioinformatics, the emphasis is focused on the development of algorithms, the development of tools that, bioinforma that bioinformatic researcher or computational biologist or biologist can use to analyze and solve the biological data. So, so to say is that bioinformatic focuses on the tool development and then the developed tool will, use by, will be used by biologists. And so that will help them to understand biology. And so if you think of it as a loop, bioinformatic focus on tool development and then the biologists will use the tool developed in order to understand biology. But I'm sure that this two terminology is a bit less loosely defined. And so you can see the two terms being used interchangeably. And so as mentioned already, bioinformatic tool is used broadly to refer to databases, like for example, GenBank, Uniprod, Protein Data Bank, and softwares, right? There are several like Pymo, uh, GeneEdit, and other also web servers, which our research group is also developing and publishing and so in the practical session, I'm going to show you how you could develop your own bioinformatic web application. And so that only requires you a minimal knowledge of Python. And I think that is fairly easy to learn. And as you will see, it's not that difficult. And if you're able to develop bioinformatics web application, this will greatly boost the impact that your research paper or your research project will have. Like for example, if you publish a model, a model will just sit in the paper, right? But then if you make it into a web application, your model will be accessible to millions of people around the world who are interested in using your model to make a prediction. And so by deploying your model, you're making a bigger impact because other scientists can use your model's prediction ability. And therefore, I believe that if you could convert your model into a a usable form, which is in the form of a web application, then you will greatly boost the impact of your work. And so, as, and so we're going to find out tomorrow in the practical session. And so you might know that some bioinformatic tools are either commercially available, like for example, from the company uh, Schrodinger or OpenEye, or um, what is it? There's so, several others. Uh, they develop a lot of great bioinformatic tools. And many are freely available, right? But then I'm gonna cover what's the difference between the two in the next slides. All right, so this is a comparison between commercially available tools and the free tools, right? So for the commercial is the cost, right? You have to pay either subscription, monthly, annually, or it's a perpetual, meaning that you pay a one-time fee and then you get to keep that particular version. But then if you want to upgrade in the future, then you have to pay again. Um, but then for the academic free version, some are free open source, but some will require you to apply for a waiver. For example, it might be free only for academic institutes, okay? So if you're from university, you might be able to use it for free, but then if you're from a industry setting, then the company will have to pay for that. And let's have a look at the features for Commercial, there will be periodic addition of feature. So you can expect that they will continuously roll out new features annually or, or quarterly. But then for the free tool, it really depends on the funding of the research group developing the tool. And also depending on the, the team that are working on tool because they're all working as a part-time, right? So they're not paid to work on the tool. So whenever they are free, they can work on the tool. And so this might be a bit less reliable in terms of the periodic features. 
And so for the support, commercial company has better support because you're paying for it. But then for the academic software, most of the support are coming from the community. And so for example, you could ask from the um, like Stack Overflow or you could ask from other community blog posts for help. And so this is not guaranteed. And so that's one thing to consider. And the ease of use is for commercial, they're trying to make it as intuitive as possible. They're trying to make it as easy as possible to use. But then for the free one, there might be some bug, right? And so whenever you encounter a bug, you could, you could notify the developer and they could correct the bug. And so it really depends on which one is suitable for you. But then in either case, both provide solid bioinformatic tools for use in your research. All right, and so let's have a comparison between bioinformatic versus data science. And so you're gonna see here that they're both similar, right? And the difference here is the domain knowledge, which in bioinformatic, the domain knowledge is of course biology. But in data science, the domain knowledge could be anything else, right? It could be finance, it could be other areas of business, right? Or if you apply it to other area, like what? Uh, the and actually there there's so several other uh, domain knowledge that you could apply it to right in economics for example and so here are some of the questions that you might be wondering why do we need computational models in drug discovery so an example is the IBM Deep Blue which was able to defeat humans in Jeopardy and in chess and Google released a self-driving car. NASA uses computers to simulate space missions. Computers are being used to simulate and design aircrafts and cars. Supermarket and shopping mall are using it to analyze customer spending behavior. And so the question is, why not use computer to discover, design, and develop new drugs? And so for example, in quantitative structure activity relationship or QSAR, which is my research field of interest, it is an area where you try to understand the relationship between the chemical structure and the biological activity. And so you normally would use machine learning in order to make the correlation between the structure and the activity, right? Because if you understand the structure of the compound of the protein, you could make, a, you could make the prediction on the activity of the compound and also on the protein. However, a lot of experimental data are needed in order to derive the biological data set that will be used for making the model building, okay? And in order to make new predictions, it might also be time consuming, right? Because it might take time to synthesize the compound. It might take time to acquire the target protein to express it from the living organism and then perform the biological assay. However, if you could build a prediction model on existing data, and then you make a prediction. And so you could bypass the synthesis of the compound. You could bypass the bioassay experiment. Therefore, you could make a prediction in only a few minutes. And so this is an example of the development of an encoder decoder system to synthesize a new molecule using the computer, right? So essentially here is that you're training the computer to understand about the chemical structure. And so you're encoding the information and then the computer will learn and then it will be able to create a new molecule. And so it is decoding it as a new molecule. And so this was published in 2018 and actually the, the full bibliographic information should have already been released. So if you Google for this author and this particular journal, you'll be able to find this paper from which the, article, from which the image was taken from. And so this is another example from a, one of our research work and so here is computational models can be used to quickly build to predict the pharmacokinetic and also the biological activity of any compounds of interest. And so this is a field known as the quantitative structure activity relationship or QSAR. And so the models can be applied for developing personalized medicine, right? Because the thing is every human beings will have a slight mutation in the target protein. And so we never know which particular alteration in the protein that you have. And so a drug that has been developed for the general population, let's say that your protein has slight mutation and therefore 
the effects that the drug will have on you might be slightly different than others. And therefore this could cause some side effect happening, okay? And so in one of our research paper, we have observed some of the influence of the functional group in a chemical structure with respect to the biological activity. And so we were able to observe that some small mutation or some small alteration in the chemical structure could give rise to drastic biological activity. And so seemingly it might look quite similar, but then if you add or replace some of the functional group as you see here in green and red or purple, I mean pink, then you can see that the chemical structure will be altered. And if you are altering the chemical structure, then the resulting activity that this particular compound will have will also be changed. And so that is the essence of performing QSAR. And on my YouTube channel, I also provide several tutorials on how you could develop such QSAR model using machine learning. And so some of these specific questions that could be answered by computational models are as follows. So let's say that you are wondering what are the target protein that your compound could bind to? Or another could be what type of compound can bind and produce the activity of the target protein of your interest. By modulating it, it means that you could activate the target protein or you could inhibit the target protein. Like for example, when you're taking a drug, the molecule of the drug will be able to bind to a target protein in your body, right? And so which target protein does it bind to? So that could be the question. And another question, which is highly relevant in this day and age is, are there similar compound to my query compound that could potentially have similar binding behavior? And so this is in the context of drug repositioning. So in drug repositioning, the concept is if you have known drugs for a particular protein and then your protein is similar in structure to another protein. And so theoretically, if you apply logic to that, proteins that compounds that could bind to protein A could also bind to target protein B because protein A and B looks quite similar. And so what works for A could also work for B. And therefore, if you could find this linkage in your computational analysis, you could greatly develop new drugs by simply applying existing drug to treat a new disease. And so in this field called data mining, and so the focus here is applying machine learning algorithms to develop machine learning models on the retrospective data or the biological data that you have collected. And so the objective here is to produce knowledge and knowledge could be compared to a gold nugget when you're comparing data mining to mining gold mining, right? So the gold nugget is comparable to knowledge that you will discover from your analysis. And so you're going from raw unstructured data to more structured data in order to uncover the patterns and also to gain knowledge from those patterns and to apply the knowledge to make applications that will help you to achieve wisdom. And so therefore you can see this hierarchy of going from data to knowledge to wisdom. And so machine learning can help you in making such hierarchical transition. And so as I mentioned already, QSAR modeling the focus is on finding the relationship between the chemical structure and the biological activity using machine learning, right? Because the relationship that you could find will be able to allow you to understand which features are responsible for the biological activity. And so this particular workflow is a five-step process that was published about 12 years ago in one of my early review article which I talked about what is the concept of QSAR modeling. And so here you can see that you're starting from a chemical structure and then you're describing it in numerical terms. You're essentially converting the chemical structure into a tabular numerical data. And then this numerical data is the molecular descriptor. So they describe the features of the molecule. And then you perform data cleaning, data pre-processing, and then finally, you use the curated data to build model using machine learning algorithm. And then the models, you could use it to make prediction. You could use it to make understanding of your feature. 
by performing feature or model interpretation. And finally, as I'm going to talk about in this, or I have already talked about, is to develop this bioinformatic tools that other people could use, right? Because the model that you develop will be alive, will be living if you deploy it into the internet. And other users could have access to that particular model. And therefore, you're making a big impact by deploying your model as a bioinformatic tool. And so in one of the Medium article that I've written about, I provided this infographic on the overview of the term EQSAR. And so essentially, we're applying machine learning to drug this. And so in this particular infographic, you can see that molecule one and molecule two, we're going to describe it in terms of the molecular fingerprint one and zero. And so if it has a value of one, it means that it has a particular feature it has a value of zero, it means that it does not have a particular feature. And then this particular data in a tabulated data frame, is going to be assigned to a Y variable, meaning that whether the compound is active, having a biological activity of being active or not active, meaning that it's not active. And so we're gonna use this tabular data set to make a prediction model using machine learning. And the essence of this is that you're correlating X and Y, right? You're correlating all of this X variable. In this example, we have 16 of them. And so based on 16 X variable, we're going to predict Y. And therefore the equation of Y equals to function of X and X has 16 of them. And we're able to make a prediction for a new molecule, molecule three. If you describe it into the molecular feature, or molecular descriptor, you're able to make a prediction of the Y, right? So the users can make a prediction. If they have this molecule, then they can see that the model has predicted the molecule three to have a value of one, which is active, okay? And the model could also be used to understand the contribution of the molecular feature on the biological activity. And so more detail of this is actually in the blog post on Medium that are written and published in the Tower Data Science. And in this particular terminology, proteochemometric, it extends the concept of QSAR that I've mentioned in the prior example here. By extending it, I mean that aside from the molecule data set, we're also going to integrate protein information into the model. And therefore, a, in a proteochemometric model, you're going to have chemical data and protein data inside the same model, okay? So for a typical QSAR model, you would have a chemical library data set, meaning that if you visualize it in tabular form, each row will represent a molecule. And so you're gonna have a data frame of molecule. And imagine that you added another data frame to it. Now you have two table, two data frames. One data frame is for proteins, and one data frame is for compound or small molecule, okay? And so this is proteochemometric. You're integrating chemicals and proteins in the same model, okay? And when they're in the same model, what can you do to this? You could perform drug repositioning, right? You could understand the similarities between protein A and B, as I have mentioned already. And if compounds that are able to bind to protein A, they're also able to bind to protein B given that A and B are quite similar. However, if B is different than A, then it won't work, right? So this is a very awesome approach for understanding and also for repositioning a known existing drug. So you could think of it as kind of like teaching a new, it's like teaching an old drug a new trick, right? You have an existing drug that you could apply it to make to use it as a new therapeutic treatment for a new disease, right? Because in practical terms, you might have already developed drug A to treat protein A, treat disease A, but then you have never tested whether it could bind to protein B, right? Because in a given experiment, the sole emphasis is placed on, you want to target protein A, but then you have no idea about protein B right? Because maybe in the future, 10 years from now, after the drug has been released, 
protein B has been discovered, right? But then at the time, it was not known that protein A and B are similar, right? And then 10 years later, it is discovered that protein B looks like protein A. And therefore, in retrospect, you could use computer to identify drugs that have been already FDA approved. And then you're pretty much reusing it. You're adding value to existing drug so that they could be used for treating new disease. And actually this proteochemometric modeling, we have worked together with the pioneer of the field. So the scientist who developed or coined the term proteochemometric was Professor Jarl Wickberg. And we have several research publication with Professor Wickberg on this. And so I could provide you the links in, in, in the future and we could add this to the description of the video as well. And back in 2015, I created this workflow visualizing the various biological resources that are available, right? So the different color at the middle here represents the different level hierarchy of the systems in biology. And so at the holistic level, we have systems-based, right? So we have intricate biochemical pathway, right? We have databases that tells you which proteins are causing diabetes, which proteins are causing cardiovascular disease. And then there are databases that tells you which protein binds to which protein, right? Like the CAC database. Or a database that tells you which protein binds to which ligand, right? So we have PopChem and we also have Protein Data Bank. And which database are containing information on the protein structure, right? Also Protein Data Bank. And which database contains information on compounds. And we have PubChem for that. And which database have the chemical fragments, right? And so several tools like OpenEye, they have a lot of software that provides you with the chemical fragments. And so the thing is, how do you tie in all of these available resources in order to develop your own bioinformatic project? Because the thing is, there's so many data available. How do you piece it together so that you could create a jigsaw and fulfill the image of the jigsaw because there's so many possibility. And in this particular article that I've written uh, in collaboration with my former PhD advisor, we developed this particular high level view that will allow you to enhance the success rate of your bioinformatic project. And so the title was maximizing computational success of drug discovery. And so I could also provide you the link in the video description as well. And so the thing is, how do you make use of the available databases? How do you apply the experimental approaches here? And how do you perform the biological or computational analysis here? And so essentially you're trying to find a connection between using the available databases, using the available experimental assays, and also which computational tools should you use at which particular hierarchy and how could you use all of that to craft your own bioinformatic project. And so in a typical QSAR, you would use data from small molecule databases and you would, which comes from medicinal chemistry. So scientists have performed, for example, high throughput screening or high throughput synthesis in order to make new molecule. And then so the newly generated molecule and the databases here will be used here in the ligand based. And then you're, you could apply chem informatic approaches. You could calculate molecular descriptors describing the molecule. You could perform Lipinski Wolf 5 filtering in order to perform your QSAR analysis. And perhaps you could use it to drive the synthesis of new compounds as well. Okay, so more information is provided in this article. And a typical overview of the procedures that are involved in the development of a QSAR model is summarized in this particular table. And so it's essentially the same as it's in a typical data science life cycle where you start from data collection, right? You're, you wanna have, let's say that you have access to a database, and then the database contains so much data and so you have to tone, tune in which particular data do you want? Which data subset do you want to analyze? So for example, out of the entire data that are available on the whole proteome, 
let's say that you're interested in the aromatase protein. And so aromatase protein is involved in breast cancer. And so out of the 30,000 proteins available, you select a single protein, which is aromatase. And then for aromatase, then you would go to the Chambo database, you would download data sets are, that are available for the biological activity of compounds against the aromatase protein. And then after that, you would pre-process the data, you would clean the data as mentioned here, and then you would build a prediction model using machine learning. And then after you have developed the model, you would evaluate the performance, whether it is acceptable. And then you would also perform model interpretation in order to make sense of the data. Okay, so this is a typical data science life cycle. And you could also apply this for QSAR model development. So more information on this is provided in this particular review article that was published in 2010 in the expert opinion in draft discovery review article. Okay, so I think I can skip all of this. So these are just a list of databases that provide you access to chemical structure information. And these are some of the molecular descriptor software that you could use to quantitate or convert a molecule into numerical form. It could, be quanti it could be quantitative or it could be qualitative. And so a popular software that we like is called Paddle Descriptors. And so actually it's not here because it was, I think it's published after 2010, but it's using CDK library as well for the Paddle. And so you could see the use of Paddle in some of my YouTube video as well. These are a list of computational chemistry software. And so essentially they're applying computational chemistry or quantum mechanic in order to understand the computational uh, aspect of the molecular structure, okay, in terms of the quantum mechanics. And so you could understand about the energy of the molecular orbitals and also the electrical or electrostatic properties of the molecule. And so the, this is the research team who helped develop all of the tools that are shown here so we published a article in a book chapter published by Springer called AutoWika. And so we developed a wrapper using Python on the program Wika and made it automatic. And so this was published, I think it was back in 2008 or 2009 or so. And it was at a time when we don't really have the term or it was part of the early auto ML. So automatic machine learning. So back in the days, we published this software that will allow you to develop neural network model and also support vector machine by just loading in the data and clicking on the start button. And then you wait for maybe a day and then the model has already been trained and optimized for the parameter. And so we developed this, I think more than 10 years ago and we published about that. And the first web application that our research group developed is called the OSFP. And we made it to allow it to predict the oligomeric states of the fluorescent protein because proteins can exist in a monomer or a dimer or trimer or, quad or other oligomeric form, meaning that proteins could have intramolecular or intermolecular interaction with one another. And so based on the input sequence in FASTA format, the web server could predict whether the protein will be monomeric or oligomeric. Okay, so if you're interested in this one, you can search for it in Google. And we published this in the Journal of Chem Informatics. And then we also have several others that are mentioned here, like Hemopred or Cryoprotec. And they're developed by our coworker, uh, Dr. Wacharat. And the other teams are involved in the development of other software as well. And we also provided some analysis of the metabolic syndrome in order to understand the predisposing factor that give rise to diabetes. And so this is based on the health data sets that are collected from the Faculty of Medical Technology. And we use it to make prediction model. And as you can see here, we published several models and papers here. And our research group is aiming to be reproducible, meaning that all of the models that we publish, we also share the data and the code. Okay. And so this was at a time before I started my YouTube channel. And so we share all data and all code. And so we hope that everyone who reads the paper could reproduce the work that we have published. Because 
back in the day, we found that it might be troublesome to reinvent the wheel, right? You read a paper and you want to reproduce it, but then you have to decipher from the materials and method part. And that might take you a couple of weeks in order to reproduce that particular work. But what if you share the entire script, the entire code and the accommodating data? And so anyone who reads your paper could just go to your GitHub, download the entire folder, maybe change some parameters or change the input data or even update the data. And therefore the model will be always relevant with the newest data, right? And so you're adding value, you're adding more impact to your model by sharing it with other people. And when you're sharing it, other people are more likely to use your data, your code. And then that also increases the possibility of them citing your research article as well. So that could also be another strategy for increasing the impact of your research work. And so we published several invited book chapters and several invited review articles in by the so, um, academic press uh, from Elsevier uh, in Springer. And we also published several invited review articles here. And yeah, do check these out. You could Google for it if you're interested in these articles and book chapters. And back in 2016, we developed, uh, we co-hosted this first international conference on pharmaceutical bioinformatics back in 2016, in January, in Thailand, in Pattaya. And in this conference, there were almost 200 or more than 200 participants coming from more than 30 countries around the world. And we have several eminent scientists, uh, sci the, the director of the Chambol Initiative from the EBI. Uh, we also have a professor uh, Gleason, who is currently in Thailand, and he has this biomedical engineering and pharmaceutical engineering uh, research group. And we also have Professor Bender, who, who is coming from Cambridge University, and he has a lot of research work in the field of proteochemometric chemogenomic and also QSAR modeling. And also we have a professor from Japan, Kyoto, who is the originator of the KEG database. And this is myself, and this is Professor Jarl Wickberg, who developed the field of proteochemometric, as I have mentioned already. And so this was the brochure or poster of the conference that we have hosted back in 2016. And so let me summarize all of the content of this presentation. And so the question is, why develop our own bioinformatic tools? And so you might know that there's already several thousands of bioinformatic tools that are already in existence. And perhaps you're thinking that all possible tools should have already been developed, right? Is it true or false? And you might think that bioinformatic tools will be available forever. Is that true or false? And another question is that existing tools may lack certain features that we need in our own project. And so what do we do? Do we proceed without this feature and hope that someday someone would develop it? Or you could put the matter in your own hand by developing the tool yourself. So if you see that there's a gap in the field, you develop it. You develop a tool that address the gap. So from my own personal experience is that back in the days when I was a bioinformatic tool user, we rely on existing tools that are available. And then we found that there are some gap in the, in the field. There are some bioinformatic features or tools that are not available. And we hope that some companies would develop that. But then sometimes we waited for several years and no one has developed that. Um, and then the thing is, we discovered that, okay, why don't we develop our own, right? So if you have knowledge in Python and you have knowledge in R, then you could use Shiny to develop your bioinformatic tools. If you're using Python, you could use Trimlet, which is quite easy to use to deploy your machine learning model. And so in tomorrow's practical session, I'm going to show you how to develop your own tool using Python. Okay, so using, bio, using R programming, I've also shown that on my YouTube channel. And also using Python, I've also shown that in my YouTube channel. And so if you're interested in for more of that content, you could check out the Data Professor channel, but then also tune in to tomorrow's practical session. So I'm going to show you how you could develop your 
predictive model web application that you could use to make prediction on the biological activity. And so tune for that, stay tuned for that one. And so the thing is, you have to approach this when you wanna develop your own bioinformatic tool, which path will you take? Would you hire a programmer to develop it for you? Or would you learn how to program it and then create it yourself, okay? And so personally, I learned myself and I also created it myself. And in this journey, it helps me to eventually create this YouTube channel. And by creating the YouTube channel, it also given me the opportunity to learn more about the latest tools. And the subscribers are suggesting so good advices, suggestion on the new tools. So they're requesting like, can you make a video about this? And then I could see that, okay, I've never learned or used this tool before. And so I always get good suggestion from the subscribers and all, I'm also learning all the time. And so this is my roadmap for developing your own bioinformatic tools. So step number one, you come up with the concept of your bioinformatic tool. What do you want to develop? And then number two is to make a wish list of your feature. What do you want it to do? So compile a list of the features that you want the tool to achieve. Number three, you create like a logical high level overview of how does the data connect with the particular methods that it should use in order to transform the input to become the output and what steps are required, okay? And so number four is to essentially connect the dot and implement the feature and the logical workflow that you have developed, right? In step number five, which is to actually code it, right? In step number four, you can see that it's essentially a collection of tasks, right? But then the logical order at which each particular task is also important. And so you want to create functions or custom function that could do a particular feature in a modular approach. And then you're you can connect the function together. And then eventually your entire workflow could connect from starting from input, process the input, and then creating the output. And then this entire workflow, if you deploy it on the internet using like Streamlit, using framework like R Shiny, you could create a web application that other people could have access to your model. And so you would create more impact on your research work. And so if you're interested in learning more about the use of data science or more about data science, more about bioinformatics, then please do check out my YouTube channel. And so I release weekly videos from one to two videos every week. And I also write some blog posts on Medium. And so you could also check out my uh, blog posts. Like for example, I shared how you could learn data science in 10 steps or actually how you could develop, how you could build your own regression model. And I try to combine infographic drawing here, combine it with step-by-step -step actionable tutorial. So you could just follow along in a step-by-step -step manner. And it's not that difficult as you thought. So if you're coming, if you're a biologist, I also am a biologist. My undergraduate degree is in biology or biomedical science. And I also, picked up programming Python only after I graduated my bachelor's degree. And so if I could do it, then anyone can do it. Just follow along with my journey and you could connect with me on various social platform and I'll be happy to entertain any questions if you could have. Thank you. Uh, if any of the participants have any questions regarding the presentation, please, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or drop or drop them in the chat box. Hello, Professor Sir. I am Krupanidhi. Hello, Professor Shani. Yes, yes. I am Professor Krupanidhi. Okay. Yeah. So you have developed a, a particular model called Talpred, Thalassemia Prediction. Right, right. That, that's what my collaborator, yeah. another is, professor yeah, at is, the... It is very interesting. Yeah. It is very interesting, sir. It is very interesting because in the local population in India also, we've got both alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia patients. With anemic right. patients, right? So it is it is better uh, to have certain models to be distributed, so that uh, by by having their uh, biomarkers, we can easily right. predict. We, you can easily predict what is right. uh, the what is the level of the thalassemia. Uh -huh. Apart from that, we can also do some prognosis and uh, uh, therapeutic uh, things. 
Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so actually it's not myself who developed this. It's actually, I'm only a co-author of the article. And so actually there's another professor at my research faculty uh, who is the yeah. corresponding author. And so if you're interested, I could also connect you with her as well. If, if you could email me, uh, maybe Dr. Abraham could, could share my email to you. Sure, sir, I will share. Right. When, in one of your workshops, are you also demonstrating as QSER, sir? Oh, uh, in the workshop, I will, be I will be showing how to develop a bioactivity prediction web application. So it's gonna, use, it's gonna be like QSAR. So you're gonna have a activity data of compounds against a particular protein. And then we're gonna predict that. So the last aspect is uh, I'm quite unhappy that uh, Ramchandran, GN Ramchandran developed Ramchandran plot in India from right. the University of Madras. It uh, about around 20, 30 years back it was quite popular. And right. in, the, in the Google Scholar Google, we used to have the ROM page, ROM page. Any student, any student can submit any sequence of amino acids. We used to get favorable and uh, uh, most favorable regions. Now, unfortunately, it is not available in the Google uh, such uh, oh. that ROM page. Okay. So getting it done, the what is it called, Ramchandran plot? It is a very Herculean task. We have to search several things. Please develop a tool for Ramchandran plot by user. Okay, thank you for your suggestion. So let it be open to the students to understand what are the favorable regions, what are five, what are psi values. Okay, sir? Right, right. Thank okay, thank, yeah. you. thank you very much for your suggestion. Uh, so uh, we have a question from Bharat. Uh, his question is how to develop a model to retrieve data using data mining. Right, so to develop a model. Okay, so I think th the sequence should be like this. You start from retrieving the data. Right, and then you collect the data for a particular topic of your interest. Okay, like for example, if you're interested in predicting the a particular disease, then you would collect the data. You would retrieve the data, and after you retrieve the data, you would clean the data set, and then you would build the model. Right, so that that is essentially the workflow. Uh, yeah, so that's all the questions that we have. Okay. Uh, so Kripanadi, sir. So Kurpana sir, can I give the concluding remarks? What of thanks to Dr. Chanin. My pleasure. Hello, Kurpana, this you. Is... Dr. Dr. Chanin, thanks for your great time and accepting our kind invitation. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much we'll for meet the invitation. In the... Yes, sir. We'll meet in the tomorrow's workshop, sir. Okay, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. So I've shared the notion link and let me hide okay and so we're here i guess everyone can see this right yeah so so today we're going to be building a simple bioinformatics web application uh in python and so the example here we're going to be using the water solubility of molecule as the topic of our web application and so the prerequisite here is going to be uh, basic understanding of biology and also basic proficiency of Python. And the resources that we're going to be using today is firstly, if all of you could install Conda on your own computer. And so Conda will allow you to manage the various Python libraries. And also it will al allow you to manage the environment of your Python and I've actually made a video about how to install and use Conda here. If you click on this, if you hover on it and click on the open link and it will bring you up here and then you could click on the YouTube. Uh, but then today I'm going to show you live uh, how you could go to Conda and download it. So you wanna go here, download mini Conda, right? Click on it, let's see, um, let me share the. And now you're going to be on the mini Conda website and so I recommend you to download version 3.8. And so a rule of thumb is whenever there's a latest version, I usually will ignore it because when it's a new version, many of the libraries might not yet support the new version. And so if there's version 3.9, I'll just go for 3.8. And if there's version 3.8 as the latest, I would go for 3.7. Okay, so for, for this case, you want to go for 3.8. And depending on which version is your Windows or is your Mac, 
then you want to click on the corresponding link to download it. Okay, so like I'm on a Mac, so normally I would click on this one. Okay, the PKC one, it will allow you to install it in a click, click, click fashion. And if you're on a Windows 64 bit, download this one. If 32 bit, download this one. Okay. And so let's go back to the web page here. Okay. And the application that we're building today is going to be based on this particular video that I previously made on YouTube. And so you could also check that out as well. And the repo of the code that we're going to be using today will be provided here in the link column and then click on the GitHub repo link. Let me click here. All right. So you're here. So this is the repo that we're going to be using today. So I recommend that you could go ahead and click on the green button here, which says code and then click on download zip file. And then afterwards, you're going to unzip that share the screen. It's right here. So when you unzip it, these are the contents. And so what we have here is the Jupyter Notebook. And the Jupyter Notebook here will allow us to build the machine learning model. And then the Python file here, solubility-app.py, this is the actual web application that we're going to be building. And the Jupyter Notebook will be producing this file, PKL which is the pickled file of the trained model. And then in order to deploy the web app, so normally the web app here, this file will work on your local computer if you have Streamlit library installed. However, if you would like to deploy it to the web, to the internet, you need to have additional files. So you need to have the requirements.txt. Let's have a look at that. So the requirement .txt here will essentially tell you the Python library and the version number. So here it tells us that we're using Streamlit version 0.71 and Pandas we're using 1.1.3. And so the great thing of using this requirement txt is that you're fixing the Python library version to a particular version that it that are known to work with your web application. So even in the future, when pandas update its version or numpy updates its version, then it's going to work. So your web application is going to work. So you're not gonna rely on the latest version. So more or less, you're kind of putting this into like a, a time capsule. And so if you're using this particular requirement txt file, one year from now, your web application will work, okay? So let me share the terminal. So I hope that all of you are seeing this terminal. Yes, sir. All right, perfect. And so I have to save this into my downloads folder. And then let's see, what's the name of the folder? Solubility. So if you're on a Mac, it will look like this. If you're on a Ubuntu or, Lin or other versions of Linux, it'll look something like this. So you will change your directory to the location where you have unzipped the zip file from the GitHub repo, okay? If you're on a Windows, you could use the PowerShell and then you could do the same thing, CD change directory to the location that you have previously unzipped the content. And so the contents that you see here are the same that I've mentioned already. And let me, dip, let me open up the application. So normally I would have to activate my Conda environment. So I'll show you in just a moment how to create a new environment. But for now, we're, we're just going to load it up. So I'll load up my Conda environment, Conda activate data professor. And then to run the app, you just type in streamlit run and then the name of the app. So it's streamlit run name of the app and then wait for a moment and then your application will load up in a web browser. All right. And so you can copy this link and then let me show you. So this thing will pop up. Okay, so the web browser of the web application will pop up. And to the left-hand side here, this is the input panel. So you put in your smiles input notation here. So here we have three example molecule, right? Molecule number one, number two, number three. And then this is like the logo of the web application. And then this is the title of the web app, description of the web app. And then we provided the links to the data, the paper at which it was coming from. And so here we're just going to reiterate the input file, the molecule one, two, three. And then here we're just printing out the molecular descriptor that we have computed. 
and we have computed the mole log P, molecular weight, number of rotatable bonds, aromatic proportion, and we compute these descriptor using the RD kit library in Python, and then it will be using a simple uh, linear regression in order to predict the log S value. And so we have the predicted log S value here for the first molecule, this one, and then the second value is for the second molecule, and then the third value is for the third molecule. Okay, so this is the web application that we're going to be building today. And so let me show you now how to install Conda on your computer. Let me close this. Let me end this. Uh, let me share the terminal again. Okay, so normally when it's still running, I would press on the control C in order to abort this. And so now let's create the Conda environment moment. But let me show you here. So on the GitHub repo that you see here, data professor, github.com slash data professor slash solubility dash app, scroll down to the readme. So this is the readme file. And then you want to you want to follow this step. So all of the instructions is provided all here. Okay. So right here we're gonna first create a conda environment. Okay. Actually, this should be solubility. Okay. And so you could copy this. Right. You could just click on this button to copy it. And then we're gonna type the contents here. Head over to the terminal. Back to the terminal. Okay. So here we're back to the terminal. Let me deactivate my original. Conda environment, Conda deactivate. Okay, now notice that whenever I, I am in a Conda environment, the name of the Conda environment that I am in will be in the parentheses before the dollar sign. And now that I have deactivated the data professor environment, I am now in the base environment, okay? So I imagine that right now you have probably installed Conda in your computer. And to figure out whether you already have Conda, you just want to type in Conda, okay? And so if you see these command here, which is like the help option, then it means that you have Conda, okay? And so normally I just use only a few functions here. So I just use Conda followed by the name of the command that I want to do. Like for example, I want to list the package here. I could just say Conda list. And so I will see all of the libraries that I have on my computer. Okay, if I say conda install and then like the name of a library, then it will install the library. Okay, so for now, I'm going to create a new environment. So I'm going to type in conda create dash n for new. And then the new environment, I will call it solubility. And then I will specify the version of the Python to be Python equals to 3.7.9 and then enter. Okay, and then it will ask me whether I would like to proceed to install all of these libraries. And so you want to hit on yes, type in Y and hit on enter. All right, and now the environment has been created successfully. And so you want to activate the Conda environment by typing in Conda activate solubility as shown here. And whenever you're finished with using your environment, you could just deactivate it by typing in Conda deactivate here. So now we're going to activate it. Conda activate all ability, right? And so let's list the package here. So this is a new Conda environment. And therefore you see that we only have a few packages here. And now we're going to, all right, let me check. So we're gonna install the Python library in the requirement.txt. So we already have it here, okay? So no need to download it into your computer. So you want to go, just go and type in pip install dash r requirements dot text. Okay, so this will allow you to install the contents. Let's have a look before we do that. So I'll use cat to see the contents of the requirements dot txt file. And so here we're going to install streamlit version 0 0.7, pandas 1.1.3, numpy 1.19.2, pillow for the image, and also the second learn. Okay, so we're installing only a few libraries here. So instead of typing in one by one, we just type in a single line and it will install all of the library in the requirement.txt file. So you want to type in pip install dash r requirements.txt, enter. So it will now install the Python libraries. 
So that should take a few moments. And the great thing of using Conda is that it's going to it will install all of the prerequisite library as well. So notice that SciPy was not included in the list, but then SciPy is a prerequisite or a dependency for one of the libraries. And so it is installing that as well. So after that, we're going to install the RD kit. And RD kit is a Python library that allows you to do a wide range of chem informatic tasks. Like for example, you could display chemical structure images. You could, you could read in smiles notation. You could then convert the smiles notation into other format like MOL format or MOTU format or even STF. You could convert it into a three-dimensional structure. You could perform molecular mechanic optimization of the, the structure so that you get, you get a relatively good 3D structure, right? With the low energy conformer. And you could also compute various types of molecular descriptor, molecular fingerprints. And, and so the Articate library will allow you to do a lot of tasks. You could even search by the substructure as well. Okay. So if you have RDKit, you could convert it. You could convert molecules into numerical values, and then you could use scikit-learn to build the model. Okay. And then you're in this particular tutorial, we will use Streamlit to, to build the web application and pandas to, to create data frames of the data set. So this should take you a while. In the meantime, I can show you the RDKit website. Okay, so this is the RDKit website. Let's have a look at the documentation. So this documentation provides you all of the essential information, like here, like here, how you could import the chem function, and then you could use the chem function to read in molecule in the smiles notation, okay? Or you could read it in from a mol file right here, dot mol. And then when you, whenever you read in a molecule, whether it be a smiles notation or whether it is a molecular file, either a mol or a stf file, it will convert that into a RDKit molecule object, okay? So it will be this object. And then afterward, you could use the object here to compute molecular descriptors, which we will be doing today. Okay, so here, let's have a look at the contents again. Okay, so you could, let's see what you could do here. So this documentation is very com comprehensive. So it, it, it is also a cookbook integrated in here. Like here, you could draw a molecule inside a Jupyter notebook. Okay, so if you activate this, you could display the structure of the molecule in a Jupyter notebook. And you could iterate through your entire data set, and then you could display the particular compound that you would like to see, right? Show the atomic properties alongside the structure. You could annotate it. You could also highlight the substructure in your molecule. You could color the atoms as well. Right here, you could highlight the substructure, okay? So a lot of things that you could do with the RD kits. And so if you're into like bioinformatic or chem informatic, then you need to use this library. Okay. All right, so let me head back to the Conda terminal. All right, so now the libraries has been installed in pip. So let's install moment. Let's do this. All right, so now we're going to install RDKit by using Conda install. And then RDKit will be installed from the uh, Conda Forge channel or also RDKit channel, either one and then the RDKit library is specified here. So this might look confusing. So let me show you something first. Okay, so let's say that I would like to install a library. I would type in conda install. And let's say that I would like to install Jupyter. I would type in like this, conda install Jupyter, okay? But if I type in conda install RDKit, okay, it wouldn't work, okay? It, it cannot find RDKit in the default repository of Conda. And therefore, we have to specify the channel, okay? So the channel name. So that is from the option here, dash C. Okay, so we're gonna specify the channel name, Conda install, and then the channel name. So look for it in Conda Forge and then RDKit, go for that. So RDKit should be available from two channels, either Conda Forge or also RDKit, okay? So this is an extra. So you could also delete this if you want. You could use either one, either RDKit or Conda Forge. Let me share the screen of the terminal now. Okay, so I'm not sure if you saw it. Let me type it again. 
I typed in conda install dash c conda dash forge and then rd kit. Okay, because dash c conda forge is the name of the channel that will allow me to look for the rd kit library. Enter to install rd kits because if you're not using conda, you could install rd kit manually. And it's going to be quite difficult to do so manually. I can show you because if you do it manually, you have to install other libraries as well as the dependency. So that might take you a couple of hours here. If you want to build it from source, okay, from Conda, but installation. Yeah. So if you go to the documentation here in, under installation, there's many ways for you to install Conda. And so it might look quite confusing because there's so many approaches that you could do, but uh, if you follow the approach that I'm showing you here, it, it will be quite simple. Just using one line and then you could install RDKit back. Uh, but for those of you who are using Jupyter Notebook, it might be a bit tricky to use Conda inside the Jupyter Notebook. But I've also provided a video on my YouTube channel where I show you how you could install Conda on a Jupyter Notebook. And then you could install RDKit there. So this should take a short moment. And so most of this tutorial will probably involve a lot of installation of the library here. So normally in my tutorial video, I would just fast forward this installation process. Okay, there you go. So it's installed already. And let's check it out by typing in conda list. Let's have a look at the libraries that we have so far. All right, and so you can see that now we have a lot of libraries and dependencies installed in, your, in our conda environment, okay. Let's try it out. Let's type in Python. Let's try import RD kits. All right, it works. So if it doesn't work, it will print out like some error message. Okay, so now it works. And note here that we have Python 3.7.9, which we have specified to be installed here. Okay, let me quit it. All right, and so now we're ready to be running the web application. Um, but before doing that, let me show you the Jupyter Notebook. Um, how should I do this? So we have to install Jupyter Notebook. So conda install Jupyter, because we're going to show you how you could run the Jupyter Notebook file, which is here, let me share this right here. So we're gonna run this in order to build the model. Okay, one moment. So uh, what time zones are all of you coming from? Most of them in IST, sir, in the standard. Okay. So we're we're at we're at nighttime right now, right? Yes, at night PM. Okay, right. So it is uh it is ten thirty for me, so it is probably nine o'clock for you guys, right? Nine PM. Moment. Meantime, we have one question, sir. Can I go ahead? Sure. One person is asking. For example, I have twenty six compounds. For these compounds, there is a data set in CSV format which includes descriptors that he has calculated around five thousand. Okay. And ICFT values of compounds, he would like to perform some QSR analysis with the deep learning and artificial networks and predicted new ICFT values. He did not calculate any descriptors for his molecule, but he just gave numbers one, two, three, four to the molecules. Okay. He's asking some program, uh, some code, any code, sample code can do that. Right. So, so he has 5,000 descriptors. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can see in the charts. Oh, okay. 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 Let's see. Let's see. Okay, I have 26 compound. For this compound, there is a data set in CSV format that include descriptor. Okay, so there's a CSV file that contains 5,000 descriptors and it has the IC50 value and he wants to perform, okay, neural networks to predict the IC50. Okay, so the question is, I will not calculate any descriptor for my molecule and I just gave numbers like one, two, three, four to the molecule. Okay, so one, two, three, four is probably the name of the molecule. I put the calculated descriptor for all complex in the CSV from some external program. I want to use the CSV and create my model with deep learning. Can a code sample be made about it? How can this be shown in the system program? Okay, yeah, so the concept is quite the same. Uh, whether you use deep learning, you could use Keras library, or you could use PyTorch. Uh, but the tutorial that we're using today, we're using scikit-learn, okay? So instead of using scikit-learn, you could use the PyTorch or Keras or TensorFlow um, 
but but nowadays uh, Keras is already integrated in TensorFlow, right? So you could use TensorFlow or PyTorch um, instead of the uh, scikit-learn that we're going to be using today. And uh, you said that the question said that he already has five thousand descriptors, so you don't have to calculate the descriptor that we're going to be calculating here. Okay, so um, for this one. We have the descriptors calculated in RDKit, which is Moloch P, molecular weight, rotatable bonds, aromatic proportion. So here is a rather very simple um, example of a QSAR model or machine learning model where we use only four descriptor. Um, but in, in the example of the question, uh, you already have 5,000, okay? And so the same thing, you have 5,000. So here we have four. And you have IC50, but here we have the log S, okay? Um, but I would recommend you to convert the IC50 value to the PIC50 value, okay? Because if you look at the distribution of your IC50, you will see that your distribution might be clustered. And so therefore it is recommended to calculate the ne negative logarithmic value of your IC50 in order to make it more uh, uniformly distributed. Okay, and then you could apply the same approach that we're using in this tutorial that I'm going to show you in the Jupyter Notebook uh, to build the model. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have already uh, installed Jupyter. So we're going to run Jupyter now. Okay, so go ahead and type in Jupyter Notebook in the terminal. Jupyter Notebook, hit enter, and then, all right. And so you, you're going to see the Jupyter Notebook pop up here. Okay. And so we're going to run the solubility web app.ipynb, which is the IPython notebook. It stands for IPython notebook. And then later it, it was renamed to Jupyter Notebook. All right, there you go. So we're simply running it sequentially. Okay. So here we're going to import pandas. So what you could do is you could click on the cell and then you could click on the run. And when you click on run, it will run this. And you're going to notice here that you see the asterisk symbol which means that it is, it is running. So it is a bit slow. Wait one more second. All right, it works now. And now we're gonna run this particular cell again. So instead of run, you could also use the shortcut. Um, on, my, on the keyboard, you wanna press the shift and enter, and then you're gonna get the same thing, okay? So I like to use shortcuts. So shift, type shift, enter at the same time, shift, enter. Okay, and then we're gonna see that the third cell has already ran okay so you get to shift enter shift enter and it will sequentially run each cell uh, from top to bottom okay so now let me explain um so here the great thing of a Jupyter notebook is it allows you to put your code in a documented fashion okay so the two essential component of a Jupyter notebook is here you have the, the text cell this is also a text cell so a text cell if you double click on it it will become a markdown language, okay? So in a markdown, you have the hashtag to represent the hash one heading. And then you have the double asterisk uh, before and after in order to make your text bold. If you have a single one, it will be italic. Let me show you here. In italic, if you have one, right, it will be italic. So you have to shift enter it. And then notice here that this one is, is in italic form. And this one is bold, right? Because we have double asterisk. And then we also have the H tag. And let's double click on this one. For this one, we only have the H tag. If we add double asterisk, it will be bold, but it looks quite the same. It just take it out. Okay. So you could Google for markdown cheat sheets, and then you will see all of the uh, commands that you could use, right? Like for example, if you click the plus, you will get a code cell. And when you get the code cell, you wanna click on here, the drop down here. You could change it into a markdown. And now you could put in text, okay? This is like H1 and then you have two, it becomes H2, H3. And so what, what is H1, H2, H3? It's kind of like this section, up section, up sub section, okay? And so, Whenever you have H1, H2, H3, so the section will be smaller and smaller. Um, 
but then there 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 are also cool stuff that you will see when you were using this in a Google Colab. If you use it in a Google Colab, you could collapse the entire H1 level. Okay, on the Colab, you could just click on the uh, the button here, and it will collapse the entire content here. And if you click on the button here, it will collapse everything underneath this particular section. Okay, so it seems to work only in the Google Colab. Uh, that's a cool feature to have. All right, and so this one in the second cell, we're going to be reading in the data set here, which is provided on the GitHub repo. So it's the Delani solubility descriptor. So this one is pre-computed. Okay, so actually we're not using RD kits. Okay, so it is already pre-computed. And so we could copy this link and let's have a look. Let me share this. Okay, so these are pre-computed descriptors. So this is in CSV format, okay? So the value is separated by the commas as a column separator. And so the first line, you're gonna see the name of the descriptors, right? We have the first value to be molar P, molar weight, number of rotatable bonds, aromatic proportion, and the log S value, okay? So actually I've shown you, so I'm not sure, let's see, right now, 22. So this is pre-computed, right? So we have previously used the RD kits, so let me let me find the YouTube video right now. Data professor is in the playlist of bioinformatics. One moment, share it here. It's in this playlist. Okay, it's right here. Part one, part two. Okay, so there's two parts. So let me copy the links for you. So in part one here, I've shown you step by step. So you can see that it takes about 25 minutes for this one, um, but I'm afraid that this will will be too long for this tutorial. So I'm gonna provide you this two links, part one and part two, in the Notion web webpage that I've shown you already. Okay, so in this video, I've explained to you what each of the descriptor mean, and then explain to you how you could compute the descriptor. Oh, advertisement. Yeah, so this one also provides the code as well. If you click here, code, it will bring you to the code page. So you could run this particular notebook, right? So this particular notebook will allow you to install RD kits on Google Colab. So you could run this on the Google Colab as well. And then this one is about installing Conda. All right, and here uh, we can see the data set. The data set is comprised of the name of the compound in the first column. And it provides the, the value of the measured, the experimental value of the solubility. And in the last column, it provides the SMILES notation. Okay, so we use the SMILES notation here, which is a chemical structure information. And then it's right here. And then we read it in. We read it in using RD kits, using the chem function. So in the chem function, we use the mole from SMILE. And then we put in the SMILES notation here, right? And it will become an object, a molecule object, right? So each molecule will be read in and it will be a molecule object and then we will compute the descriptor for each shown here, okay? So each molecule, this is molecule one, molecule two, molecule three, four, five. And so this data set has a couple hundred molecules, 1,144 molecules, okay? And then we, we iterate through the entire molecule list, right? So we, we, we iterate through using the for loop, okay? And then we've created custom function Right here, we define our own custom function to calculate the molar P value, the molecular weight value, the number of rotatable bonds, right? And then we created a data frame in pandas here. And then after we use this, this custom function, which takes in as an input argument, the smile notation. So here we use the custom function that we have generated and then using as input argument, the smile notation and then it will spit out the data frame of the computed molecular descriptors. So actually, aside from the three descriptor that you see here, you could modify right here, right? You could add additional descriptors, right? So you could copy this line, copy it, and then you could add additional lines here, right? And then you could cherry pick the descriptors that you would like to be calculated in this code, right? You, have, you could have like additional maybe uh, 10 or 20 or 100 additional lines here so that it will calculate additional descriptors, okay? 
So actually that's the content for another, another tutorial. Maybe I'll, I'll create a video tutorial video on the YouTube channel as well. So in RD kit, there's so many descriptors. Let me show you then. I, I hope time will allow. Okay. So, okay. So I try to finish this part in 15 minutes and then I'm going to show you the actual web app. Okay. So we will have about half an hour for that. Okay. So let me go back to the RD kit documentation. Let's, let's find the example. One moment. Descriptor right here. Okay. So you could just find, right? I type in command F or control F and then I type in descriptor and then here descriptor calculation. So aside from the Moloch P as shown in the tutorial that we're using today, you could also calculate other descriptor like the TPSA as well. Okay. So in order to look at the full options, you want to click on the link here, like the API or actually right here, list of available descriptor. All right. So right here. So there's so many descriptors, right? Look at this column, list of available descriptor. There's so many gas cycle charge. Okay. And we use only a few, but then some of them might be a bit redundant and you also have to compare. Okay. Which one are redundant? Number of amide bonds, number, the ring count, right? TPSA. Okay. And then they also have 3D descriptor as well. So you probably will have to generate a 3D confirmation of your molecule. And so that will require optimization using molecular mechanic force field as well. And if you want to have more accuracy, you could also use quantum mechanic or uh, computational chemistry in order to optimize your molecules geometry. And then you could calculate other quantum mechanic descriptor like the energy of the molecular orbital. And also here you could calculate molecular fingerprints as well. And they have a couple here. Okay. And each fingerprint type here will have several hundreds. Okay. Okay. So this is very nice. Let's see, there's a lot of descriptor that you could calculate and you could feel free to add it into the custom function that I've shown you right here. You could add it into this custom function, right? All right, and now that we already have generated the descriptors and then, and then it's going to read in the data frame of the calculated descriptor and it will perform the data split, which I will be showing you in this notebook. So let me close this. Okay. So part one and part two, I'll provide you the link. Okay. Let me do it right now. The link share copy, maybe add it to notion. Let me share it to you. Okay, so Notion is a very good application. Um, if I'm not sure if some of you have used Notion, it's a good note taking application and it's very powerful as well. And it has a lot of templates. So um, I'm going to make some video of this soon. So let's see, learn more helpful. Okay, let me add a new entry and it's going to be, what should I call it? I'll call it Chem Informatics Part 1 and the links here. And I'll call it Chem Informatics Part Two. Open, and let me find the link. And Part Two will essentially be using PyCaret to build the model. And so PyCaret is a Auto ML uh, library in Python. So Moes Ali has developed this awesome library. And so you could, you know, in only a few lines of code, you could build machine learning models using a lot of machine learning algorithms in one one run. Okay, there you go. So came in from part one and part two is right here. And actually I could provide you the GitHub link as well for your convenience if you wanna try this out in your spare time. Let's see, part one, part two. Part one is this one. Part one, part two, we have two files. This one. Okay, so the links are provided here, the, the link to the GitHub repo. And let us now start create the web app. Um, but first we have to head back to the Jupyter Notebook. So many windows open. One moment. Okay, let me share the screen. All right, okay. So we have loaded up the data frame here. And now we're going to drop. So for this data frame that we have loaded up, Okay, it's called data sets. I could create a new cell here. I could type data sets, shift enter, and then it states data frame. So what I want to do now is uh, I want to split this into X and Y variable. Okay, so the X variable will contain the first four column, and then the Y variable will contain only the log S column. Okay, so I, I'm going to split 
block s to be column to be variable y and then the first four variable will be the variable x okay and therefore i created here x equal to data set dot drop and i'm going to drop the last column the log s column okay and then i specify it to be x variable and therefore you see that the log s column is now gone okay and now we're going to specify the last column here the last column minus one the last column to be the y variable okay so this is one way of doing it another way would be to say y equals to data sets log s see the name log Yes. Okay. Same thing. You get the same, the same output. So there's many ways, or you could also do it like this. Y equals data set dot log S. Let me show you. Okay. So there's three ways of doing the same thing. Okay. So uh, select whichever approach you like. Okay. And so we get the Y variable to be the log S column. Okay. And now let's have a look. Let's have a look at the X variable. And let's have a look at the y variable. Okay, now we have x and y, so we're good to go. Now we're ready to use scikit-learn to use x and y to build the model here. Okay, so in this tutorial, we're not gonna perform any data split. We're just gonna use x, y, the full data set to build the model. Uh, but then in your own custom uh, workflow for your own research project, I would recommend you to perform data splitting as well. And so here we're gonna use a basic linear model, okay? So we're gonna use the linear model function from the sklearn. And then in order to evaluate the model performance of a regression model, because here we're gonna build a regression because the y variable is quantitative, okay? So it's a floating number, okay? So however, if we wanna do classification, then we're gonna use different metrics here, okay? So for regression, we're gonna use the R squared value and the mean squared error, or we could also use mean absolute error as well. Okay, so up to you. But then for this tutorial, we're just gonna use mean squared error, okay? So run the cell, and then we're going to create a variable called model, and then we're gonna assign the linear model dot linear regression function to this variable. And then we're gonna train the model by using model.fit, and then the input argument will be X and Y and X and Y has been created here as we have done previously, okay? It's taking quite some time to load it on my local computer. And let's train the model, shift enter here. Okay, and the model has been trained fairly rapidly. And let's make the prediction, okay? So model prediction. So as you can see here, uh, the, the Jupyter Notebook is documented so that you could read it, okay? You could also provide more expl explanatory text below here. Like for example, this is here, or um, we will now perform the prediction by applying the trained model. This will be performed by using the model.predict function. And then you could use that you could highlight this by using the tick, right? And you notice that it has this like gray color on the background as well to highlight it, okay? And then the text font looks a bit different. So this would highlight the, the function name, okay? So you could you use this, let me show you, okay? So you could use like superscript by using the dollar sign before and after, and then uh, this would represent the superscript. If you want to make it like, let's see, um, evaluating, uh, like for example, if you have the term IC50, you want to do it like this, okay? And note that you need to have the opening and closing braces on the 50, because if you do it like this, let me show you, then only the five will be in the subscripts, okay? Therefore you need to have the braces around the 50. All right, so this is just to show, but it doesn't make sense because in this example, we're not using the IC50, okay? We use the R square and the MSE, okay? So MSE is the mean squared error, all right? And so we're gonna apply the model.predict function and then we're gonna use the X variable and then we're gonna assign the prediction into the Y underscore pred variable. 
and then the predicted value is shown here. Okay. And if you want to convert this into like a data frame type, uh, we could use it into a series and then we could say Y pred. Um, but then we're going to assign this to, let's create a new variable. Let's call it Y pred without the underscore. And then, oh, it's not defined. Okay. Yeah, this is capital, capital, right? We have it here. And so we have this as a column now because before it was as an array, okay? So here we're using the pandas series. And let's see, what if I want to combine it to this data frame again? This is X, right? But yeah, okay. So I have the X data frame here, right? I want to combine these two data frame, X and Y pred, okay? So let me show you how you could do that. You could do pd.concat and then, and then you want to use the opening and closing bracket. And then you just type in X, the element that you want to combine. And we're going to combine Y pred. So just type in Y pred. And now you want to do X is equal to one, shift enter. And now you, you see the predicted value is shown here, okay? But let's say that we want to show it alongside the actual value y. So we could also do put the y first, and then we put the y pred next. Notice that this one has to have a variable. Is it name y pred? Let's call it log s, log s pred. Okay, so I added the name to log s pred to the y pred variable and let's combine it again. And there you go. The name of the column is updated. And then I have to assign this into a data frame in order to save it, right? And then now I have it as a data frame, right? And let's say that I want to save this into a file. Then you could just do df.2 CSV and then you could name the file. You could say uh, results.csv, hit enter. And then you, you're going to get the CSV file. Let me find it it's right here. So this is the resulting file. Okay, so we're right here. Lock S pred is right here. Lock S is right here. Okay, so you see the actual value and then you see the predicted value here. Okay, so you could save this as a file. All right, let's continue back to the Jupyter Notebook to actually build the file and so that we could actually build the web application. Okay, so we have 25 minutes left. Let's go back to Jupyter Notebook. All right, here. So I just added this as a bonus in this tutorial, just in case you're wondering. Um, right now we're gonna print out the model performance right here. So you can see the coefficient of the regression coefficient. Okay, so, you know, like in a typical, let me add more explanation. Like uh, in a typical linear equation, you have like this. For this one, we have log s equals to the four parameters, right? We have mole log p, we have mole weight, we have number of rotatable bonds, and an aromatic proportion. Okay, so here we have the intercept to be this value. So that's our equation. And then we have ar to be here. It's right here, it's sequential. So we have this one multiply by, and then this one is right here. So this is our equation. And then this value is right here. This plus, right? This minus this one, minus more weight. And then the first value is right here. There you go. So that's our linear regression equation. So this is the equation generated by this particular model. Okay, and to get the uh, intercept, it's right here. You use this function, model.intercept. To get a coefficient, you use the model.colf. Okay, to get the mean squared error, it's the mean squared error function. And to get the R2 score, you get, use the R2 score function. And the input argument will be the actual value, y, and the predicted value, y pred. Okay, and so you have the R square value to be 0 0.77. And then we have the mean squared error to be 1.01, okay? And then, oh, actually I created this already. Okay, right, so in re reverse order, I have this one, right? Okay, so I've already shown you how to do it programmatically already. So, you, so this equation is generated automatically, okay? So even if you add 
additional data to this data set, it's going to generate this equation automatically for you. Okay. And now let's create the visualization of the predicted value. So this is the plot that you have generated, right? So this is the experimental and the predicted log S value. So it looks pretty good. And now we're going to save it out. Okay. We're going to use pickle function here to dump it, to save it into a P PKL file. Okay. And so let's do this. So let me make a note here is that if you, if you want to save the model out, make sure that the model that you saved here is done locally. Um, because if you do it on the Google Colab, the thing is Google Colab might be using a different version of scikit-learn and therefore it might not be compatible with your, your app web application. Okay. So you might be using a different NumPy version. You might be using a different scikit-learn version. And so the PKL file that is generated will not be the same, okay? So you wanna do it locally on the computer that you want to run the web application. Let me show you the contents of the web application. Take a look at the solubility app.py. Hey, okay. share the screen. Okay, right here, share Adam. Okay, Get this one better. All right, so here, so let's have a look generally. So this particular web application is only 110 lines of code. Okay, so that's not a lot of lines of code to make this fully functional web application that you have saw. And so the first couple of lines here, we're going to import the libraries, right? We're going to import all of the necessary libraries that we're using. So you can see here that we have Pickle, which is the trained model that we have done already. Um, because the thing is, we don't want to retrain the model over and over and over again, right? Because the data set is, is the same. So we just want to train the model one time, and then we deploy that trained model. And then the, the web application will take the query molecule, the input molecule, and then it will use the RD kit to perform the molecular descriptor calculation, okay? So just a moment ago, I, I told you about how we created this custom function to calculate the molecular descriptor. So we, we have to put the, the custom function inside the code here. Okay, so we documented that here, custom function. So lines number 15 until 57 is the custom function to calculate the molecular descriptor. And then lines number 63, so this is essentially just going to display the logo of the web app. Let me go back. We find the application. Oh no, okay. We have to run the web app now. All right, so let me close the Jupyter Notebook. So let's go back to the terminal and I'm gonna control C to exit that. And then it's asking me whether I want to shut down the notebook server. I say yes. Oh, it's resuming because I took longer than five seconds. So let me do it again. All right, now I exited that. And now I'm going to run this solubility app.py. Streamlit run solubility app.py. All right, and now this is the web app. Okay, so the image variable that I have talked about just a moment ago is this image that I have drawn, the logo of the web application. Okay, let's go back to the code. All right, and then we we use the st.write function in order to display the heading of the web application. As I mentioned already, we use the h1 tag here, which is the, aster uh, the hashtag. So the font will be big. So it's a heading tag. And then we describe the web application here. And then the side panel will be shown here. Uh, let me show you back to the web application. So note that on the side panel right here, on the left-hand side, you have the text box that takes in the smiles notation as the input file. I mean, as the input text. So each will be a molecule, right? So for example, I could modify it. And then after that, I wanna press shift. I wanna type in command enter to apply it. And now the prediction, as you see, is right here, it's updated. So this thing here, the third molecule notation matches this third notation here, okay? So this is the side panel, and let's go back to the code. It's right here. Where were we? Right here, so, smiles input. Right here, st.sidebar.textArea. So textArea function will allow us to have the text box 
and st.sidebar will tell us the location that we want to place the text box. So if we delete this part here, it will not be placed in the sidebar, but it will be placed in the main panel. Okay, so we're gonna leave it there. Okay, so here we're just taking in the small notation, and then we're uh, this is the default uh, input that you saw, the three molecule that you saw. Slash n is the new line. It means to hit on enter. Okay, so there will be enter at the end of the first line, and then another enter at the end of the second line. All right, and now after that, it's going to calculate the molecular descriptor, and then it's gonna here assign the calculated descriptor to the x variable, and then and then essentially that's all, right? On lines number one hundred three, we're gonna load in the train model. Uh, remember the train model that we have used in the Jupyter notebook is right here, solubilitymodel.pkl, and now we're gonna load in the model and then we assign it to the load model variable. And then we're gonna use load model.predict. And then we're gonna use the X variable here. X is right here, the molecular descriptor that we had generated. And so it will use the molecular descriptor that has just been calculated from the user input from the side panel. And it makes the prediction and it assigns the prediction into the prediction variable. And then it will place the prediction underneath the st.header here, okay? And that's it, that's, that's essentially the web app. Let me go back and show you the web app. Okay, so I've, I've, I've told you that it will display the computed molecular descriptor and then it will display the computed log s value, which has been okay. And so as you can see here that this is a very simple web application. And so I have already explained to you that we initially loaded the necessary libraries for this one, like Streamlit, NumPy, Scikit-Learn, RDKit, right? And so the user will put in the molecule that they want, right? And then command enter or control enter, and then the app will run the prediction in real time, okay? In real time, okay? And it makes the prediction. And so it takes in the input molecule as a smile notation, it performs the molecular descriptor calculation, right? It displays the input molecule that you have placed in the text box. It displays your input here. It then computes the molecular descriptor and it shows the computed molecular descriptor here. It takes these computed molecular descriptor and apply the model.predict function to make a prediction. And then the resulting prediction value will be displayed here. Okay, and so this is essentially the web application contained in the app.py file, okay, and I think we, we've done it, okay? So we have 10 minutes left for questions and answers. So I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you may have. So uh, I have a question. With this model, we can predict the descriptors for a new uh, uh, molecule? Yes. So we're not predicting the descriptor, but we could calculate the descriptor, and then we could predict the solubility value. Okay. Right. So the RD kit will be used for calculating the molecular descriptor. Yes, Afrin Khan, you can unmute. Hello, sir. Thank you for a wonderful explanation. Uh, so I wanted to know for any QSAR uh, model, they ask for applicability domain. So okay. how could we calculate that in machine learning? Okay. So uh, actually, we've done a couple of research articles where we calculate the applicability domain. So normally we like to use the principal component analysis. So you could calculate the applicability domain by performing PCA analysis on your, your data sets. And then you could also do the same for your training set and then your, your uh, test set. So if you perform data split, right? You could do the PCA of your training set, of your test sets or of your other external sets. And then you could visualize the, the distribution of the molecule in the scores plot. And so that will essentially be your applicability domain. So if the new compound or the test compound fall outside the applicability domain, meaning that they do not overlap, it means that a new compound is not predictable. So it is outside the applicability domain. And so actually, actually I've never done a a web app for that. Maybe that could be a good idea for a future video as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll probably make a video showing you how to do that. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, Rohit. Okay, uh, sir, I have one question actually. Uh, that right. is a nice presentation. Thank you. So, as you have told that we can save pickle file if uh, from any cycle version. And right. after that, where we want to use in different Python version or cycle version. So we cannot use. So like I have saved one uh, pickle file from uh, suppose cycle as 1.9 or something. And if someone is downloading, like I have given my code uh, to the GitHub. So if someone is downloading my code, so he can use or he cannot use or any right. other method to save the pickle file so anyone can use in any cycle. Right. That's a great question because uh, on one occasion where I trained the model on the Google Colab, and then I downloaded the pickle file into my local computer. And then when I try to show the uh, the web application, I try to run it. And it, it gives me an error that, okay, you're using a different version of scikit-learn. And, but then when I trained it locally, and then I used the pickled file, so, so there were no issues there. So there might be some compatibility issues. So I would recommend you to share the code and then the, the user can download that code and they could also train it locally on their own computer. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, Jeff, my Dave, do you have some specific question? You can ask. Okay. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes, Hello. Kishan, go ahead. Uh, suppose I want to do this training without the descriptors. I just want to put the smiles into the training model, like a regression model or something. How can I do that? And uh, is uh, what which model would be uh, good for such case? You mean you and want I, to use the smiles, but you don't want to calculate the descriptors? No, without using the descriptors. Suppose if I uh, means I just want to take the smiles, uh, uh, re read it, and put it in the training model. Is it, uh, is it possible? It is possible, and actually we're doing that as well. So for that, the thing is you're bypassing the descriptor calculation. And so therefore the descriptor will be the smile notation. And so right now we're, we're experimenting with using that. Uh, we're, we're experimenting with using the smile notation and then we're performing tokenization, meaning that we're gonna split the smile notation into the fragments. So each character will be kind of like a descriptor in a cell. Like for example, uh, in, in, in a typical smile notation here, let me show you. So in the side panel here, you see that NCCC is a molecule, right? So it will tokenize it, meaning it will split it into NCCC, and then it will essentially see it as like a, like a character, right? And then it will compare. So if another molecule contain N in the first position, and another one contain N in the first position, it will be the same, right? And it will have uh, like for example, you could represent it as an image. And so this would be like maybe uh, have a value of one, one. So the thing is, does it contain N in the first position? It, if it does, then it will have a value of one. If we have a value of one, if it doesn't, it will have a value of zero. So therefore you will perform tokenization on your uh, small notation. And then that will be the, the descriptor. And, and then we'll have to use, uh, and they, we could use like deep neural network, like LSTM, or you could also try out the scikit-learn as well you know, using random forest. So right now we're experimenting with that and hopefully we'll, we'll pu publish a paper and maybe write, make a YouTube video about it. Okay, so Rohit, can you conclude Rohit? Okay, thank you, Abraham. And uh, thanks for joining. This one is, uh, this is an excellent lecture and everything was crystal clear. And I hope all the participants understand everything. If they want to enhance their knowledge, so they should visit the Data Professor YouTube channel and they right. can uh, see the video and they can ask the question from Professor Chenin also. He has summarized and he has also uh, showed by hands on that how you can develop a regression model. And this is very good for the advert prediction. When you, uh, like you are using some tools in the web designing for the advert prediction, but most of the user don't know and they don't read the paper that how uh, our model, uh, our, uh, how our compute, computer are, uh, uh, we are giving the input as like compound and right. it is calculating the descriptor and on the basis of descriptor, it is giving the values. So mm -hmm. generally the user uh, don't think so maybe he they can correlate with that regression model and one more thing that they can also use that regression model in their research purpose. 
when they want to develop any QSAR model. So I hope that uh, everything was crystal clear. And thank you, Professor Chenin, for excellent invitation. Thank you. It's my big pleasure. And actually, let me make a note here that if you're interested, you could also go to my academic GitHub as well. Let me share. Let me show you on the screen. So let me find that. Is it right here? Yeah. So my academic GitHub is github.com slash Chenin Lab. And so these will have repository of research articles that we also published. So for example, in the HCV Pred here, if you search for this article, we have already published it. We published it in the Journal of uh, Computational Chemistry. And so you could read the full article here and then the, the full text, I mean, the full code is provided here. So we provide you with the curated data set. We provided you with the code and the descriptor, the R code that you could use to reproduce our work. So here we use R and then you could perform our model building from the code. And we, we also shared the code to several of our other papers as well. So you could check out the, the GitHub here. This is the first GitHub. And let me, why don't I put this in the chats, into the chat. And another one would be Channing and another one would be my GitHub for the Data Professor YouTube. So all of these three, so the GitHub of Data Professor will contain the files and the code used in the YouTube tutorial. Uh, Channing N and Channing Lab will contain the code that we use for our research publication. Okay. Yeah. Like Thank for you, example, sir, here. for the information. Right, like if you click and, here. Uh, you, yeah. are, uh, you are gently contributing towards the science because uh, you are creating the code and uh, you are also creating the notebook. And I uh, think that GitHub is the most useful thing to learn the data science and other things mm -hmm. in the machine right. learning. Because mm -hmm. thank you so much, sir. Exactly, thank you so much. The session is over to Ibrahim. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Kalyani, ma'am. Kalyani, ma'am. Can you thank Chanin? Dr. Kalyani is also one of the organizing secretaries. Okay. He's with the talk. I think uh, I think she is having some mic, mic problem. I I am going okay. to end the session, sir. Thank you so much okay. for accepting our kind invitation, Dr. Chanin, sir. We are looking forward to uh, work with you, sir. More collaborate with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chanin, sir. I am going to end this meeting now. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And so I hope that this video was helpful to you. And please support the channel by smashing the like button, subscribing if you haven't already, and also hit on the notification bell so that you will be notified of the next video. And also hit on the notification button in order to be notified of the next video. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey.